friends, I welcome you this morning. Does that sound like it's working? Not bad? Okay, good. Welcome. My name is Spencer Fluman. I'm the executive director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship here at Brigham Young University, and I'm grateful to welcome you all here this morning uh, for this talk by uh, Dr. Uh, David Gore. Um, before we get into introducing him, just a couple of housekeeping items uh, for you. We'd invite you to follow us on your social media platform of choice to keep track of all the events happening at the Maxwell Institute. We have a steady stream of excellent to spectacular kinds of things going on. That's, that's our range. We have a weekly brown bag, a monthly newsletter that keeps you up to date, periodic lectures like this, symposia, conferences, publications. We've got a lot going on. We want you to be in touch. So would you follow us? Uh, start out at uh, mi.byu.edu if you want to kind of fly over of the institute. Go there and then uh, from there keep track of what we're doing. We'd love to have you involved in the important conversations we always have going on. Secondly, uh, speaking of electronics, would you silence yours uh, so as not to be a distraction uh, throughout our event? To get us started, I've invited Dr. Leslie Hatfield, a uh, faculty member in the Department of History here at BYU to offer an opening prayer. Our Father in Heaven, we're grateful to be gathered together in this setting and here at BYU. We're grateful for this opportunity to learn from uh, Professor Gore and the insights that he uh, has into our scripture. We ask thee to bless us with thy spirit and help us to be open and help us to think in productive and new ways and um, think of things that we can do um, after uh, this talk. We're grateful for all the blessings we enjoy and we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. To introduce our speaker, David Charles Gore was born in Provo, but grew up in Aurora, Colorado, where he graduated from Smoky Hill High School, which is, I'm told, literally on the old Smoky Hill Trail. He graduated from the University of Wyoming and UW's LDS Institute in 1999, and twice graduated from Texas A&M with an MA and PhD in rhetoric and public affairs. Currently, Dr. Gore is professor and department head in the Department of Communication at the University of Minnesota Duluth, where he's taught since 2005. There, he teaches courses in the history and theory of rhetoric, including the rhetoric of globalization, philosophy and rhetoric, and stoic rhetoric. His research explores the interactions between religion, politics, and theology in order to promote civic engagement and virtuous living. He enjoys reading, weightlifting, and exploring the trails around Lake Superior with his neighbor's dog, Bailey. That seems to beg for a story. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see if we have time. He and his wife, Kathy, are the parents of five, two of whom are BYU students currently serving missions in Guatemala. Dr. Gore is the, re is the author of the very recently published by the Maxwell Institute, The Voice of the People, Political Rhetoric in the Book of Mormon. The title sold at fine booksellers everywhere. I'm staring you all down, <laughs> every one of you. Okay, good, good. His lecture today is entitled Equality and Self-Indulgence in the Book of Mormon. Please welcome Dr. David Gore. Thank you, Spencer, for that introduction. And I want to thank the Maxwell Institute and BYU for being such great hosts this week, and Blair Hodges for his promotion of the book and also his work behind the scenes. And I also want to thank Shirley Ricks and her editing team for their work on the book. The idea for this book came to me about 20 years ago when I was first starting out in my career. In fact, it was right after I attended my first academic conference in communication. And on the way home, I was thinking uh, and reading, actually, Isaiah 29. And I got to thinking about this phrase, the voice of the people in the Book of Mormon. 
And I thought, I, I really thought it would be interesting to try to figure out what that phrase means, both in the context of the scripture, but also in the context of public life. Because in the Book of Mormon, that phrase is used so many times to describe the kind of conflict and uh, energetic disagreements that sometimes occurred among the people that are uh, recorded in the Book of Mormon. And I wanted to explore that. I was lucky enough to find myself in an academic discipline, the field of rhetoric and public affairs inside communication studies, that was unique. In 1980, one of the foundational texts of that field was by George A. Kennedy called Classical Rhetoric and its Christian and Secular Tradition from Ancient to Modern Times. And that field, I think, allowed the elbow room to really start thinking about some of these questions uh, in the context of a, an ability to sort of toggle between both religion and, and secular views. Not bracketing our religious views, but searching for common ground, which is really the core element of the communication discipline. I was lucky enough, after thinking about this book for about 10 years, to, to meet uh, Adam Miller and Joe Spencer. And both of them were working on a project at the time that eventually morphed into what's known now as the Groundwork series that, was, that published this book. And that, and that Groundwork series is based on an invitation to study uh, or explore scripture from a theoretical perspective. And so I tried to bring the theory of rhetoric to bear on scripture to see what can be learned about political discourse from the Book of Mormon. As I say, the text of the Book of Mormon is full of potential and political controversy, a record of a people who had much dispute and wonderful contention one with another. And so I wanted to explore that. I also wanted to call, uh, to explore what I found in the Book of Mormon, which is what I call the, the tragic nature of politics. And I'll say more about that in my presentation today, but basically the, the idea here is that everything, particularly in the Book of Mormon, can just fall apart. Obviously we fail to live up to our own potential. As Emmanuel Levinas said once, politics left to itself bears a tyranny within itself. Or as Enoch Powell said, all political careers end in failure. I wanted to think about what that means and uh, why that, that might be a prescient comment or concept here. For me, the tragic nature of politics in the Book of Mormon, that things fall apart and they fall apart really fast, is really an invitation to check our vanity. It's an invitation for us to think about uh, the role that vanity and anger might play in our own political positions and in our politicking in life. King, King Mosiah's intention was clearly to uh, remove anger from politics and to diminish the role of vanity in our political disagreements. The outcome, unfortunately, was not altogether favorable, though, because as we know, uh, in the three chapters that I explore in this book, there's a great deal of conflict that happens in the Book of Mormon, and that conflict has primarily to do, uh, well, it turns into a civil war that ultimately ends in the annihilation of thousands of people. And that's quite a sobering thought to think about, to start off with, uh, that his political career also may uh, not have accomplished everything that he'd hoped. And so I want to explore that concept a little bit today in, in this presentation as I talk to you about equality and self-indulgence and think about rhetoric in the Book of Mormon. So one of the most profound insights into rhetoric gleaned from the Book of Mormon comes toward the end of Alma chapter 1. This chapter contains the account of Nehor murdering Gideon, Nehor's subsequent trial and execution, and the subtle development of the Nehorite craft of manipulation. The insight takes the form of an aphorism or maxim, a kind of pithy epigrammatic statement that has long been a feature of rhetoric. The power of any aphorism is that it acts as an invitation to readers to participate in their own persuasion as they reflect on the insight contained in the phrase. The rhetorical maxim of Almas, to which I'm referring, is the speaker is no better than the hearer. One might skip over such an insight if moving too quickly, but if reflected on properly, in its context, we can begin to understand the weight that equality bears in our relationships and with each other in our communities. The speaker is no better than the hearer suggests that even minor distinctions between people may be problematic and that the conventional inequalities that surround us all the time may deserve some re-examination. We might even reverse and thereby amplify this maxim, the hearer is no better than the speaker, in order to gain even further insight. 
If we begin with the notion that speakers and hearers are on an equal plane, then we might end up questioning much of what we think we know about rhetoric, which could also lead to a reconsideration of much of what I think or what, I, what we think we know about social life writ large. In what follows, I want to illustrate a close reading of just two verses, or 130 words, of Alma chapter 1, in order to create some space to think about equality afresh. The word equality appears only one time in the Book of Mormon. The word inequality appears six times, mostly in Mosiah 29 and Alma, in the Book of Alma. The word equal appears only 12 times in the Book of Mormon. Contrast that with liberty, which appears 47 times, and free, which appears 81 times, one might be tempted to think that equality is not a major theme in the Book of Mormon. However, I find it as a major theme in King Mosiah's peculiar project, which is that everyone should esteem his neighbor as himself and labor with their own hands. The inequality that Mosiah decries is when a king must answer for his people letting the people off the hook of their political responsibility. He wants very much to share responsibility among everyone in his society. Nehor's project, on the other hand, seems to be the exact opposite, that every priest and teacher ought to become popular and avoid labor altogether. The contrast is a simple one, designed surely for didactic purposes, but it shows the threat that self-indulgence poses to equality. In his essay, God and Philosophy, Emmanuel Levinas contrasts the sober coldness of Cain a being in and for oneself, to the wisdom of Abraham, who interceding on behalf of the wicked proved himself a being in and for others. These two rival ways of being in the world, being in and for oneself and being with and for others, is a helpful way to see how the Book of Mormon places responsibility for others prior to freedom. To return to our maxim, if the speaker is no better than the hearer, then why do we so often loud speakers and their power? Why, at least sometimes in public life, do we place a high value on articulate precision and the ability to secure as far as possible the agreement of our hearers? It is hardly disputable that societies tend to value skill in speaking and that skill in speaking is valuable. Yet at the same time, uh, in rhetor rhetorical theory, we can claim only that good speakers are better than poor speakers at speaking. That's, that's about as far as we can go. There are those who are quick to attribute, though, some superiority to speakers, especially good ones, and to place them on an unequal plane with their hearers. This presumption of superiority has, no doubt has various explanations. Perhaps we might attribute it to an assumption of inferiority on the part of non-speakers, feelings that may arise because they were not invited to speak, or if they were invited to speak because they fear the inadequacy of their speech. This is, of course, not a fear exclusive to non-speakers. Even more often, and probably more likely, we encounter speakers who hold themselves above their audiences, who abuse the privilege to speak, or worse, hold their audience in contempt. This tendency to misapprehend the relationship between the speaker and the, and the hearer, to set them on an unequal plane, may be ingrained in our nature, but it's also often supported by social convention. After all, speakers are often at a podium or on a stage, standing while their audiences sit, as we are today, they're often physically above their audience. By convention, it's almost always speakers, not hearers, that are promoted. I imagined as I was writing these remarks, if the Maxwell Institute took a picture of you, the audience, the hearers today, and put up posters around campus announcing your presence at today's lecture, <laughs> that would certainly be unconventional. Speaking of convention, occasionally, when we have heard a good discourse, we walk away a little amazed, perhaps struck by the profundity of the speaker or admiring their knowledge or some other good quality in their character. We can be quick to forget that the ability to admire the right qualities is something primarily audiences can do. Rhetorical amazement, believe it or not, is a function of the preparation and readiness of hearers as much as it's made possible by the preparation of speakers. To put all of this as directly as possible, what defines the relationship between speakers and hearers are their obligations to one another. Defining relationships in terms of obligations or duties serves as a helpful opening into what the Book of Mormon teaches about political rhetoric. It helps us move toward equality, because speaking existentially, our obligations are infinite. That is, they extend beyond the capacity of what Paul calls earth and vessels, which is to say that in politics and in life, the call to be responsible is greater than our capacity to respond. The maxim, then, the speaker 
is no better than the hearer is a phrase, as you might note, that I have slightly modified from its context for rhetorical effect. Here we see it in context. The priest, not esteeming himself above his hearers, for the preacher was no better than the hearer. Neither was the teacher any better than the learner. And thus they were all equal, and they did all labor, every man according to his strength. The passage rightfully begins with how a speaker or preacher esteems themselves in relation to their audience. Given the natural power imbalances that can arise between preachers and teachers and their hearers and learners, this is a good place to start. Yet you note that the passage does not end there. It ends instead on a note of radical equality, where all were equal and labored according to their strength. We can put Pan out even further than, than this part of the, of the passage that I'm looking at to the full 130 words in the context of what's happening in, in Alma chapter 1. Now this was a great trial to those that did stand fast in the faith. Nevertheless, they were steadfast and immovable in keeping the commandments of God. And they bore with patience the persecution which was heaped upon them. And when the priests left their labor to impart the word of God unto the people, the people also left their labors to hear the word of God. And when the priest had imparted unto them the word of God, they all returned again diligently unto their labors. And the priest not esteeming himself above his hearers, for the preacher was no better than the hearer, neither was the teacher any better than the learner. And thus they were all equal, and they did labor every man according to his strength. These 130 words come in the context of social persecutions, particularly of those who are Christian. These uh, troubles, what Grant Hardy calls troubles, in which those practicing priestcraft grew more sophisticated in their pursuit of riches and honor, and also in their persecution of those who were trying to be steadfast. Without lying or breaking the law, the followers of Nehor pretended to preach according to their belief, to persecute believers in Christ and afflict them with all manner of words. Persecution of any kind obviously is a real hardship, especially religious and political persecution. And this verse teaches us here that uh, one, of the, one of the factors that we need to develop or cultivate in our societies is a, an ability to be steadfast and immovable and patient in the face of affliction. At the same time, we also see in this passage that there remained a task to perform in the midst of those trials, a call to carry on with the work. In this passage, uh, and throughout the Book of Mormon, in fact, equality is aligned closely with labor. This passage is no exception, the word labor appearing four times. This is a not so subtle reminder that we have a lot of work to do if we're ever to learn how to communicate effectively on a plane of equality. Such communication is necessary for our communities to flourish to their fullest. Interestingly, the passage speaks of the obligation of hearers to periodically leave their labors to hear. If we really believe in the power of rhetoric or in the power to persuade and be persuaded, then we need to learn how to listen. One of the tasks of rhetoric is to act as an audience from time to time. I remember a few years ago when I was called into jury duty in Duluth, I can't tell you how many people tried to give me ways to get out of going to jury duty. Everyone had a suggestion for how to avoid this call to service. And uh, when I showed up for jury duty, I was brought into voir dire, the, or the jury selection, and I was again surprised by how many people were deliberately trying to get out of serving on the jury. They were trying to get themselves disqualified for service by making really outrageous statements about uh, their, their thoughts about uh, the case at hand. The task of capable discussion requires that we are prepared to listen, not just as jurors, but in a wide variety of other contexts. Our failure to listen effectively is often a mark or a bearer of inequality. If we can justly criticize Nehor for his ostentatious arrogance, we should also interrogate ourselves for the many ways in which we fail to live up to the obligation to really listen to others and to fully offer ourselves as hearers. Not only must we be prepared to leave our work from time to time, we also must be ready to return to it. Diligence in rhetorical labor means not allowing ourselves to be taken in by praise but to continuously pursue praiseworthiness. Diligence in rhetorical labor means not just learning how to hear and to offer a hearing, it also means learning how to speak without setting ourselves up or puffing ourselves up. Diligence in rhetorical labor means being willing to impart knowledge to others freely without any feeling of superiority on our part. 
I do not think that this comes naturally to very many of us. I know that I've not always been an effective listener, to be sure, nor have I always been able to implement a kind of perfect equality in my rhetorical practices. In this regard, it makes the idea that the speaker is no better than the hearer uh, something that really should be seen as an invitation to work out and to realize. In other words, speakers and hearers are not always seen as equal. And the fact that we see this equality placed next to labor and like next to a call to work suggests that we all have some work to do in order to see ourselves equally with one another. Labor in this passage is shown to be something that promotes equality, not something that creates inequalities. We can all give what we have the strength to give in order to strengthen our communities. Doing that much will certainly make, make us less likely to support persecution in any form and to shoulder what are the necessary burdens of public life. As I've already hinted, when the speaker and the hearer and the teacher and the learner are placed on an equal plane, it can transform what we think about rhetoric, which is at the core of all that happens in social life. Rhetoric is a practice that we engage in repeatedly throughout our lives, and the practice of rhetoric has a long and storied history. For the Greeks who coined the term, rhetoric was situated as one of a trilogy of interrelated arts and practices designed to promote good citizenship. These three arts are politics, ethics, and rhetoric. Conceiving of public life via three interrelated arts provides flexibility for understanding the different facets of public life. The art of living in a city, politics, thrives, thrives best when linked with ethics, the art of developing and practicing good character, and also with rhetoric, the task of discussing things capably. While a strictly political or ethical reading of the Book of Mormon would seek to uncover dimensions of citizenship and character, a rhetorical approach emphasizes speech, discourse, and, and processes without forgetting how, to ta how the task of capable discussion is intertwined with citizenship and character. As a task, rhetoric draws on art, law, and custom to promote capable discussion, which is something that often promotes or produces agreement. While the Book of Mormon does not offer us a systematic rhetorical theory and never uses the word rhetoric, the book nevertheless engages in reasoned discourse about public life, at least tangentially and in fragments. The primary rhetoric of the Book of Mormon is religious to promote the message of Jesus Christ. While developing that cause, I claim that the Book of Mormon also makes a real and serious contribution to understanding the human predicament. Though it never develops a rational uh, philosophy, I find in the Book of Mormon a rhetoric of responsibility emerging from the tensions and oppositions of public life presented in its history. Reason and intuition do battle with desire, both within us and within our social worlds, to produce awareness and consciousness. Rhetoric does not depend on a wholly rationalistic account, but seeks to bring emotions, marvels, and symbols together with humanity's rational powers, all of which seem alive in the text of the Book of Mormon. What is it about human beings that makes us desire inequality? What is it about us that allows for inequality to foster in our relationships? What makes us think or act as if we are better than other people? What is it about our social systems that set people up above one another? And how is it that striking the right balance in these relationships and in our rhetoric might, might help us strike the right balance in the rest of society. In other words, how does the way we talk to one another and the way we listen to one another influence uh, not just our, our personal or interpersonal relationships, but also our societies and our political culture? Rhetorical theory is long distinguished between an ideal <coughs> philosophical rhetoric and more pedestrian, corrupt, and corruptible forms. Describing the ever-current practice and more uh, of public speaking and persuasion, Rhetoric includes the full range of ethical and dignified approaches, as well as the morally suspect and shoddy ways of persuading audiences like posturing, pomposity, and pretension. While always related to ethics and politics, the term rhetoric could be accurately used to describe Mosiah's letter to his people, quoted in Mosiah 29. But it could also describe Nehor's efforts to build a rival church and his attempts to justify the murder of Gideon. Both are instances of speech designed to influence audiences. Is rhetoric an ethical form of persuasion, 
or a low kind of self-justification. Plato himself vacillates between these two options in the Gorgias, presenting rhetoric first as akin to cookery and makeup, interested only in tastes and appearances, and then later highlighting rhetoric's kinship with philosophy and justice. There will always be those who claim that might makes right in politics, who think that what you can get away with is your just reward. They typically use rhetoric to enable them to commit injustices with greater ease. And Socrates was really interested in a different kind of rhetoric. He was interested in a kind of speech that was not, it, not going to promote self-aggrandizement, but instead a kind of speech that would be that would cultivate a willingness to suffer injustices, right? So instead of, instead of, uh, <clears throat> instead of developing our power to commit injustice and to see what we can get away with, Socrates really invited us to think about how, how can we develop the power or the skill to endure uh, the suffering of injustice when, when, we, when we suffer it or when those around us must suffer it. Of course, that can be somewhat risky because we also want to see a rhetoric that brings us to justice. We don't just want a rhetoric that, that allows us to endure it. But he, Socrates seems to think that, that those things are very closely related, that our capacity to endure or suffer injustice in life is very closely related to our actual desire to practice justice and to enact justice in the world. He also thought that we, sh we, would want, we should want our friends to turn us in if we've done something wrong. We should want a kind of speech that would, that would welcome punishment or correction for wrongdoing. And those, of course, that's not an easy kind of uh, speech to develop either in ourselves or in other people. But that's really what uh, Socrates calls us to try to do. How do we build up our capacity for suffering and justice? And how, do we, and how is that related then to our ability to see or enact justice in our relationships? Are there words that we can speak that will lead a soul to justice? And if so, how can we speak those words? Speaking authoritatively, as noted, is a crucial skill and the power of the mind for good or evil consists in argumentation. Good rhetoric draws on the power of the passions and the power of the mind. The tools of argumentation can be misused for evil purposes, but their power for good cannot be discounted. As an art of politics concerned with securing agreement, rhetoric touches all modes of life. Every public and practical thing we do, from biological science to selling dump trucks, is something that exists and progresses by way of persuasion. Some economists have even estimated that persuasion accounts for at least one-fourth of GDP, as illustrated in the work of lawyers, judges, public relations specialists, counselors, editors, reporters, uh, salespeople, professors, teachers, all of whom spend most of their time persuading other people. Rhetoric in all, is in all the practices of the media, the law, the economy, and the state. As Isocrates observed long ago, by the power of speech, we have not only escaped the life of wild beasts, we have come together and founded cities and made laws and invented arts. And generally speaking, there's no institution devised by humans which the power of speech has not helped us to establish." Close quote. Despite its ubiquity, the study of rhetoric cannot solve all of our problems. Of course, not every problem that we face is a communication problem. But to the extent that we can inoculate ourselves against what Wayne Booth calls rhetricery, those shoddy arguments that induce confusion and misery, we're much better off. No one, I think, can read the Book of Mormon and not see in it a work deeply concerned with human communities. Although I take for granted the idea that political regimes and constitutions are among the things that inevitably fall apart, history shows us that conflict and controversy can bring about shifts through which orders collapse and unions dissolve. Making arguments to each other, not having an argument, but making an argument, is to appeal to the intelligence and passions of other people. And I, I take it as a sign of deep respect. Of course, argumentation can be used to criticize or demolish the communities that we live in, just as it can be used to build them up. Rhetoric is an essential art for helping us become undeceived about ourselves and about our communities. Some kinds of rhetoric may heighten the risk of political failure, but it's also an art that can assist us when things fall apart. Speaking of the Book of Mormon, Nathan O'Hatch sees that book's radical argument in favor of equality as a document of profound social protest, an impassioned manifesto by a hostile outsider against the smug complacency of those in power, and the reality of social distinctions based on wealth, class, and education. The speaker is no better than the hearer. 
This is not merely a critique of those in power, but a critique of power itself. By sounding a warning against trusting political power, the Book of Mormon does not advocate quietism or deny the capacity for political solutions to human problems. Hence the near constant proximity of labor to equality. Political regimes and economic systems tend toward corruption. The Book of Mormon is, after all, a record of a fallen people, or perhaps more precisely, records of fallen peoples. In that regard, these records cultivate what I call a tragic view of human politics. The tragedy of human politics is the realization that most of human problems are caused by human beings. And at the same time, these problems cannot be fully solved by humans. While this grim picture might be reason to despair, I see it instead as an invitation to act to address our problems and their effects, but to act in a new kind of way. Specifically, I find in my reading of Alma, it, I, really what I did in this book was read three chapters of the Book of Mormon very closely. And those three chapters are Mosiah chapter 29 and Alma chapter 1 and 2. The beginning of that section in Mosiah 29 is the story of a king, a monarch who has lost his faith in monarchy. And his desire is to transform uh, the system of government from a monarchy to a, a reign of judges. And I found an interesting and peculiar parallel between Mosiah and the prophet Samuel in the, in the Jewish scripture. The prophet Samuel being the last of a line of judges who established the monarchy. And so I wanted to explore that relationship between Mosiah and Samuel and to see uh, what could be learned about what's happening in the Book of Mormon. I saw in Mosiah 29 a really, a really profound parallel to the story of the, of the anointing of, of first Saul and then David in the Old Testament. And so I wanted to sort of push this, that space out a little bit and to explore the room between the, that, that uh, story and the story in the Old Testament. Then, as, you're, as you may know, Alma chapter 1 is an account of Nehor and his rebellion against this new government and the establishment, his attempt to establish a new church in that society, and uh, subsequent to that, his, his trial and execution for murder. In Alma chapter 2 is a, is a great civil war that breaks out. There's a, an account of Amlesi who wants to make himself king, and so he goes through the process of trying to be made king legitimately by using uh, the system of government that Mosiah established, and it basically there's a kind of uh, an election or some kind of uh, hearing in which the people cast in their voices about what to happen, what should happen, and they decide that they don't want a king. And so Amosai's response is that he uh, makes his followers angry and anoints himself king anyway. And a great civil war breaks out. And so I really was interested in the first five years of, this, of the reign of the judges and the story that happens in Mosiah 29, Alma 1 and 2. And so I read that story very closely and tried to draw upon its connections to stories that happen in, in the book of Ether and elsewhere in the book of Mosiah to try to explore some of the tension that was happening at Zarahemla in that society, in that culture at the time, to see what principles I could draw out about rhetorical theory and about rhetorical practice and that might have relevance to our own time. I suspect, uh, as, I, as I did that, obviously, one of the things that becomes quite apparent is that, that violence and that destruction that happened in that civilization and the death of many people. The, the last verse of, of Alma chapter 2 is, a, is an account of a kind of uh, the, the death and carnage that came in the wake of this failure of the society. It's, and the, the bodies of dead people are literally heaped up in piles. It's quite, a, it's quite an apocalyptic vision. And that's where it, it was pretty, pretty easy to infer from that, this sort of concept that politics can be quite tragic. And that uh, our ability to act in a mournful way is something that we need to learn how to cultivate as, as speakers and as listeners. Again, as I say, this grim picture is not a reason to despair. I see in it instead an invitation to act, to address our problems and their effects, but to do this in this new kind of way, and again, specifically to act in a mournful way. The clock is always ticking on our political regimes and on our political parties. At the same time, as we try to fend off corruption and decay, we're surrounded by and immersed in it, this in turn calls for what might better be referred to as a religious response, a willingness to mourn about and in the state of human affairs. Among the things we need to learn how to do is how to do our duty citizen, as citizens fully conscious of all of our failures to perform our duty, and also at the same time fully conscious of the inadequacy 
of all that we can do, even if we do all that we can do. This is part of what's at stake in the political crisis and civil war in the first five years of the reign of the judges in the Book of Mormon. What's important about this approach to politics is that it frees us from the need to search for a total or final solution to human problems. This or that political act will not in any final degree resolve the problems it aims to fix. But this frees us from the burden of having to finish the work. It also opens space for us to be modest about what, we can, what can be accomplished through political action, to see the real limits of politics in our everyday lives. In short, it opens space for meekness to emerge as a political virtue, to let go of resentment, to indulge in compassion in public life, and to work quietly to improve our communities, and to gently nudge one another towards a politics of friendship. In conclusion, I want, I want to spend just a moment speaking about the Nihorite self-indulgence as a contrast to the equality that should prevail between speakers and hearers. And I'm sure that we'll have some time for Q&A before uh, we all have to run our separate ways today. At the beginning of Alma chapter 1, in what is roughly the center of the Book of Mormon, Nehor serves as a preeminent example of a priest who did the opposite of what meek persons do. Nehor sought to distinguish himself and his hearers by making himself popular, doing no work, relying on the people to give him money, wearing very costly apparel, promising his hearers that they need not fear and tremble because all should be saved unconditionally. He was lifted up in the pride of his heart, we're told. Among those who were steadfast and immovable, patient and diligent in their labors, Nehor gains no traction. First and foremost, among those steadfast and diligent was a man named Gideon, whom Nehor murdered because he indulged even his anger. Mormon seems to close this first chapter of Alma with a rhetorical accumulatio, which is a term in rhetoric for amassing points made previously in a compact, forceful manner, often as a list. Rendering the text in this way offers a climatic summation of a distinction between two rival ways of life, a distinction that Mormon views as prescient. The accumulation of the two paradigms that Mormon presents are in stark opposition to each other. The conflict that he summarizes runs through the center of every one of us and through the center of every human community that has faced the decision about what it values and how it should express those values. Will we be in and for ourselves? Or will we discover the strength and determination to be in and for others? Like Nihor, will we place ourselves above others? Or will we support efforts toward genuine equality? After all, the speaker is no better than the hearer. The two lists do not compare favorably. One is clearly to be preferred over the other by Mormon, and hopefully he thinks by the readers of the Book of Mormon. Although we know at the same time that people living both ways of life can exist in the same community at the same time. The peace between them may be tenuous. They contend, as I say, warmly with one another. And they even came to blows. Those who were faithful to the Church of God had the following characteristics. They were steadfast and immovable, patient in persecution. They were all equal. They all labored according to their strength. They were willing to give freely of their substance to the poor, the needy, the sick, and the afflicted. And they did not wear costly apparel. The effect generated by these actions was a kind of prosperity and wealth that was discovered through liberality. By giving away what they had and not sending away any who were in need, they did not set their hearts on their riches, and they were free and liberal to all. These actions enriched their entire community. They did not regard age, political status, sex, or religious status as reasons to withhold sub substantial support or respectful treatment. They did not con connect self-respect or standing in the community to external factors, but adopted a point of view that favored generosity and kindness over conformity. Alternatively, those who persecuted them lived by a very different set of values that were rooted in being in and for oneself. That list includes self-indulgence, sorceries, idolatry or idleness, babblings, envyings and strife, wearing costly apparel, being lifted up in the pride of their own eyes, lying, thieving, robbing, whoredoms, and murder. While the legal system surely had claim against some of these actions, it could only punish what it could uncover and prove. Those who practiced these vices learned subtlety, but from time to time, they were brought to justice, suffering 
according to that which they'd done. As passions went unchecked, their actions perhaps grew into something strong, stranger and more violent. What's important to note here, I think, is that every community will likely have a mixture of these two paradigms. Just as every one of us struggles against being in it for ourselves instead of truly being in it for others with a pure heart. The body politic must be robust enough to endure contention and ill will and also a host of other wrongs. But its health at the same time depends on fostering worthy and virtuous opposites like cooperation, goodwill, benevolence, hospitality and generosity and self-restraint. To the extent that we forget that the speaker is no better than the hearer, we run the risk of valuing popularity over integrity and failing to shoulder the public burden, which it is our duty to carry more for. Thank you. We certainly have some time for Q&A. I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have if there are any out there. Yeah. I'm wondering how, how you would, um, in an era where sometimes experts are discounted, how would you negotiate um, the, the speaker being able to the hearer and not denigrating the, the role of actually having expertise? Yeah, that's a really great question. So the question just, they asked me to repeat these for the video. So uh, the question was about expertise. And in an era when we denigrate expertise, how, how do we uh, deal with that distinction then between someone who actually maybe knows what they're talking about and uh, the kind of equality that's supposed to prevail between audiences? And I think, that, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, certainly, expertise has its value in our society and our culture. And I, and I do value that and see uh, see the contribution that it can make to these disagreements. I think I, think I would say that uh, there's, a, there's a way for us to, to share expertise in a way that doesn't uh, necessarily have to highlight inequality. That would be the question is, what, what could experts do uh, to make their messages uh, more acceptable or more palatable? But I also think the, the second part of the, the answer really would probably rest primarily on audiences. How do we cultivate an audience as a capacity to recognize when someone knows what they're talking about or when our refusal to listen is really about ourselves rather than about the content of what we're being told? And I think that's, that's where I think what's really interesting about uh, what, I've, what, what I've found in the Book of Mormon here is this idea of obligations, that audiences have an obligation too. And I think right now uh, we're, we're seeing a, a time where perhaps audiences are less inclined to do the, the, the heavy lifting that's required for them to be effective citizens. Of course, we can't have a culture or society where experts get to decide everything. And that's a, that's a difficult tension, though, because the expertise can be real. There can be knowledge that, that, that certain uh, people have that other people lack. And that's often the case when it comes to audiences. This is where the study of rhetoric also becomes really important, because the study of rhetoric is, is supposed to be an art that's open to everybody, right? So, on the one hand, there's this obligation for experts to be able to teach their message or to say what they have to say in a way that would, would be accessible to a wider audience. But then there's also an obligation on the part of audiences to do the, to do the work of being prepared to listen and to prepare to do something about uh, really understanding the core of, of any given problem. Hope that helps. Yeah, at the back. Uh, similar, I guess, maybe building on that question, um, at Near, near the beginning, you said um, the, a, a good speaker, the only thing we know about them is that they can speak well, not necessarily that their message is, yeah. uh, is useful. Um, how do, so with, um, with the line from the scripture, uh, the speaker is no better than the hearer, that, um, how, how do we balance that against the speaker is potentially more informed than the hearer? Or, yep, I mean, it, it, no better doesn't necessarily mean has nothing more to say than the hearer does. Yeah, I mean, that's where the other, the second phrase there, the teacher's no better than the learner, right? Uh, right. Is the other piece of that. And that's, and that's where uh, it's interesting to think about because I think we, we tend to want to create distinctions, right? Teachers, particularly at the university level, they have titles. Right. And these titles are really significant and people work really hard to achieve them and so on and so forth. And so there is this sense in which we want to categorize uh, the, the power of speakers or distinguish them from one another. 
And so I, I, I do think that's real, and I, and I do think some of that uh, does constitute a kind of awareness or a kind of knowledge that needs to be imparted uh, to, to hearers. And so I, I do think that's exactly the problem I'm interested in, in thinking about. I, I don't know that I've, I have complete and total solutions for that, but I do think that, um, at least in my experience, with, with the best teachers that I've had in my life, I, I never had a feeling like they held themselves better than I was in any sense. They were also really interested in, in teaching me how to learn for its own sake and in being there right next to me as learners too, really, in, in many ways. And so it was that feeling, I, I guess, of, of a sense of solidarity and also that, that component of work that I talked about, that they were willing to do the, the, the work of, of, of persuading me. And they saw in me, uh, kind of, they respected me enough to know that, that, that they would have to do some extra work because maybe I wasn't getting it. And maybe I was slower. I was, there was some kind of block in me that stopped me from learning what they were trying to teach me. It's amazing how, you know, even in graduate school, there are times when my teachers would try to teach me something, and years later, I finally learned what they were teaching me. And I, and I finally put some pieces together that, oh, yeah, they were, they were going on about that, and I didn't get it that, when they did that. And so I think that, you know, when it, when it comes to, to both as, as hearers and learners, it's, we're also talking about a, pro, a process of growth here. And sometimes we're not ready to grow uh, when a teacher is teaching us. And, and that, can, that can, again, contribute to that inequality we're talking about. Or it can contribute to a kind of a sense of equality and a sense of togetherness in the work that, that we have to do. And, that's, and the best teachers in my life certainly had that, had that spirit of togetherness, the spirit of camaraderie and friendship. Uh, I, think about, I think about philosophy and, a, and about learning as a, as a mode of friendship and befriendment and teaching, too, in a way. And that's, and that's tricky because, you know, I, I can't be friends with all of my students. That's not, not in the way that I'm friends with my friends, who are even more equal to me. But I have to s cultivate a spirit of friendship in that relationship, right? Um, and there nevertheless has to be some distance because we can't be friends with everybody that we might teach. But at the same time, that's, that to me is, I guess, the model, both for politics and for, for teaching and for learning and speaking, is we're, we're trying to create friendship together. We're trying to promote friendship and friendliness and, and, and genuine kindness. And that's the kind of equality that I think we're talking about here. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I was really interested in a community that contains people, individuals with both of these characteristics. We can take that analogy and say, what about our internal characteristics and the dialogue? The, sometimes we contend warmly with ourselves. Absolutely. And I wondered for you, what are useful ways internally of developing those characteristics, and how do they or how might they not relate to the community? That's a great question. So uh, the question was about, about the internal characteristics of people and how, and how we have this conflict between in ourselves as well as in our communities with other people, and how do we, how do we cultivate in ourselves the capacity to, to truly befriend others and to build a strong community. So I am one of those people who thinks that if you put two people in a room, you're going to have three opinions. And I'm also one of those people for me that, that often I have two or three conflicting opinions about the same topic. So, and I think our, our media system certainly today does a lot of injustice to us as audiences because it wants to present everything as having two sides, when in, in my experience everything is many-sided. And there are many, many perspectives from which to see the problems that, that in, uh, afflict our, our society and our culture, both politically and socially. So I do think that we, we want to have a kind of diversity of perspectives and be able to protect that. Uh, but at the same time, how do I cultivate that in myself? I, I, I guess there was a lot of times when I was writing this book when I was in deep anguish about what I was trying to say because I knew that I wasn't measuring up to some of the principles that were being taught here about how to relate to other people. And I, and I still have that anguish, right? And so there were parts that were very painful to write for me where I really did think about for myself about whether or not it was possible uh, to, to maintain that kind of commitment to, a robust commitment to, to being friendly even, or to being uh, ready to, to shoulder the burdens that come on a community. I think as I've, as I've learned over, over time to develop a capacity to serve other people, that certainly has helped. Um, and and to, to be ready to, to be there with other people. You know, that's when I, I, I slightly adapted what Levinas wrote in his essay to being with and for others. 
uh, his, his phrase is being for others. And I think that probably captures all of it. But I wanted to add the being with and for others because sometimes it's enough for us to be present with other people and to be ready uh, to, to respond to their needs in, in the moment. But speaking politically, I think we, I think the other part of that is, is developing that capacity to mourn. When we look back at this story, one of the, the, real, the real insight for me comes in actually in Alma chapter four, when Alma's looking back at his people and he's, he's describing their, their awareness of just what a devastation has been caused in their culture by their failure to, to live appropriately, to, to the failure to live up to that equality that Mosiah set for them. And as they're looking back, they say that they, they mourned. Every person had a cause to mourn. And eventually that mourning pr promoted a kind of wakefulness and attention to their duty. And so I think there's something, too, in that, in that, in that ability to mourn, to really uh, be sorry if, if there is conflict in our communities that is unproductive conflict, that is, that is wasted conflict in the sense that it's just tearing people apart or dehumanizing people instead of creating resources for progress. Now again, these things are a very fine line because uh, sometimes when we, we want to argue for compassion or civility in public life, we're forgetting that sometimes the, the lack of compassion or the incivility that we're seeing is, a, is really a protest against injustice. And so that there, I think the best way for us to respond though is, in my reading of this, is, is really for us to cultivate that sense of mourning. And what does it mean to mourn, to really be to really be uh, grieving, grieving for the failure that we have and the failure that we see around us in our culture. I think we need more of that. I'm not sure how to get it, <laughs> to be honest with you, but I think we need more of it. Yeah? You spoke in regards to the structure of inequality, particularly in speaking environments, speakers raised up, these, these kinds of, uh, which we also see in the Book of Mormon. Um, what for you are some of the sort of rhetorical signs of, of, of equality of discourse and uh, inequality of discourse? What, what do you look at when you kind of hear a speaker and say, okay, I can see what they're doing there, that is, and this is tending towards equality, and this is tending towards equality? So the question is, what, what do I see in speakers that tends towards equality or tends towards inequality? What is the distinction here that really matters? Um, that, that, that moves us in the right direction. And I guess for me, uh, I'm, really, I'm really taken in by one of my favorite books by James Boyd White called Living Speech. And he says that living speech, speech that really lives, is the kind of speech that, that refuses uh, to, to dehumanize other people, that instead tries to accept them as, as human beings and accept them where they are. And so we see a lot of speech in our culture today from advertising jingles to uh, any kind of discourse that, that is intended to move people that, that I think is, is really uh, trying to short circuit our, our ability to, to really reason. And I, I think cliches fit in this category, right? Any kind of trivialization of speech or trivialization of people's experience, this is all speech that I think fails to live in the way that, that White talks about. Propaganda, advertising, all that. And I, what, I, what I think actually the Book of Mormon refers to is babblings, which is just when you're just, you're just saying stuff, right? It's actually crafted to keep thought at bay, this kind of speech, and it's crafted to, 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 make, to highlight that inequality between people that we want to we wanna do away with. So what I really want to do is, is see us find words that can move us towards love and justice. And I know that sounds maybe a little bit um, naive, in a political space, to think that we could have speech that's about love and justice. But that's the kind of speech I really want. And I do think it's possible. I think it's, I think it's possible for us to speak words that are loving and that are just. And the more that we do that, uh, even, in, even in political contexts, the more likely I think we are to see, to see a society that, that is robust and equal in the kinds of ways that I think I've been talking about today. Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful. I think we're about out of time. I want to thank the Maxwell Institute for the opportunity to be here and thank everybody for the questions. I appreciate the opportunity that I had. Spencer?